What's up, everybody? It's Matt Johnson. We are back with another episode of Real Estate Uncensored. This is the place where you get actionable ideas, insight, and inspiration to turn your real estate career into a life of freedom. And we've got a phenomenal guest on the show with us today, one of the few repeat guests that we've had on the show. And we brought him back for a reason, which is because he absolutely kicked our butts the first time. Uh, <laughs> he is an absolute master at sales, languaging, scripting, and phrasing. And so we're going to go deep on some cool stuff today. We're also going to see kind of what's on his mind and what he's working with uh, with agents recently. Uh, we're going to take some of your questions. We've got all kinds of stuff that we're going to do today. So before we get to him, let me welcome in the junior grandmaster who's in the co-pilot seat where he so belongs. Greg McDaniel, how are you? <laughs> what up, Johnson? Hey, man. Yeah, I'm super pumped about the show today. Joel and I were just riffing <clears throat> off air and uh, just kind of doing some some you know, verbiage playing around. And you know, we, were, we were brought up something that we're going to talk about a little bit later. Um, and it's all about disclosure and how to disclose what to disclose and what you know all all of those different aspects of, of real estate but um gosh you know today is just one of those things it's just been one hell of a good day all damn day long uh, i got stuck at a walkthrough <laughs> uh because my sellers forgot to uh leave the lockbox, so i had to drive 20 minutes into their new rental turn around drive 20 minutes back 40 minute round trip to get one little key to do a walkthrough stupid shit sometimes man mm. but I am glad to be here. I made it here. My hair was on fire. You came in after, even after me, but Joel's going to make it rain. You guys, this guy is <laughs> not your average duck. He's definitely, he is a very smart guy and he's going to help you understand how to use your language to be more efficient and more effective when it comes to working with your buyers and your sellers and other probably fellow agents. So dude, Joel, what up, man? Welcome to the show. Hey man, thanks for having me back. Uh, really appreciate it. I'm humbled and honored and flattered to be one of your uh, apparently few repeat guests. So thank you so much for, for inviting me and for hosting. Really appreciate it, guys. Well, with your value, how could we not? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So one of the things that I remember uh, about your, your last appearance, the, the moment that really hit home for us was when you kind of, it was, it was an objection handler. It was something very, very easy for you. And it was it was the way that you handled it by leveling up and going going up a level in terms of like getting yeah. them to think about the much much bigger picture, and that blew that it blew both of us away so much that uh, that we we went obviously deeper into it in that episode and and so guys go back and listen to to Joel's original episode we won't we won't re retread the same ground, but that was such an incredible approach. I mean I ended up taking your your class right your mm -hmm. yeah. your so I believe it's is it twelve week course. Right. Yeah, the Six. 12 week workshop it's called the language of agreement. Yeah. Mm. Language of agreement, which is incredible. And so guys, by the way, Joel, where can people go to check that out before we get in too far off the rails? <laughs> Make it as easy as possible. It's the language of agreement.com. Perfect. All right, so yeah, yeah. Um, so Joel, give people some background kind of on how you came to to really focus on giving this particular workshop and and just your own real estate background just in case they didn't catch your first episode. <laughs> Sure. Um, so I started in the world as a young nerdy engineer, and I was uh, my first degree is engineering. I was a smart nerdy engineer uh, for many, many years doing design projects, uh, and I was mostly the smart guy working in the cubicle. And then I decided one day, uh, after designing a bunch of things for this company that they were selling forty and fifty thousand of them a month, and that I designed, but they couldn't afford Christmas bonuses. I thought <laughs> this wow. is not the place for me. So, um, yeah, I thought I should be in business for myself. And so I, I got this, like, you too can get rich quick in real estate audio course that I got at, like, 2 in the morning off an infomercial with a dude on a yacht with a bunch of girls in bikinis. <laughs> I, think, so, I think I literally watched that infomercial a week ago. Yeah. 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 Seriously? <laughs> yes, because Chris, so Chris Lockhead wanted to show it to me. <laughs> so I, I signed up for this course and then I uh, brazenly went out and bought a couple of what uh, were probably crack houses and flipped a couple <laughs> of houses and made a couple of bucks and decided that was much more fun than working for other people. And uh, so I started flipping houses. And uh, in that process, everyone I touched, I had to deal with a realtor. And after doing a few, I was just really disheartened that the realtors seemed to be sorely lacking in integrity and just out of frustration. I, I like that both of you guys laugh. So just out of frustration, I went and got my license because I thought, look, if I'm going to be an investor, I need MLS access. I need to move quicker. I need a key. Uh, I need a super key to get in houses. Uh, I need to be, I need to write my own offers. And so I got licensed just for me. 
And then I had people approaching me saying, oh, my God, you're, you're licensed. Would you help me? Would you sell my house? Would you? And before you know it, I was a broker. And uh, I, was, uh, I was agent of the year or whatever, rookie of the year at REMAX in the early 2000s. And then uh, I just started getting requests to come like, well, what are you doing? Would you come teach us? Would you come teach here? And it just opened into a bit of a teaching career. So when the market collapsed in 07, 08, somebody offered me an insane amount of money to go live on the beach and teach. So I did. So well, that, uh, that does I've not suck. I've, yeah, that didn't suck. So I've not been agenting very much these last few years. Um, I've been teaching a bunch and just like flipping a house here and there and doing my own investment stuff. And uh, yeah, that's how it all came to be. So as a, as a nerdy engineer, I think I look at language a little differently than other people. And, um, you know, I, I, I sucked at this. So all this is stuff I had to learn. So remember the yeah. quiet, nerdy, shy engineer, I had to learn, you know, how to get in rapport. I had to learn how to win friends and inf influence people. I had to learn how to, you know, get connected with people who were upset. If I'm calling expires and they're yelling and screaming, how do I get them calm? How do I get connected with them? How do I solve these problems? So I just, I looked at every issue in setting an appointment and getting a signature and overcoming objections, you know, just like any good engineer, those are just problems to be solved. That's it. So fortunately in the That's real estate world, there's only what 10 or 20 objections, right? So learn how to solve each one a few different ways and you're golden. So yeah, Jill. people always think that like they have a unique objection or something like that. When I think what you're saying is very, very right on. When there's only a certain amount, finite amount of objections, just <laughs> how to tackle them differently. I was at a Tony Robbins event <clears throat> in yeah. Salt Lake City a couple of months ago, and um, yeah, he was walking through the room asking people for what what their biggest problems were, and he was just shooting them down right and left because look, yeah. you're, not you're not unique. 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 Come up with something that's unique, and then you can then we can have a yeah. conversation. And I think it's a, real, it's a really big point to hit on is the fact that, you know, you, you, you're you not super unique. There's not so, – you don't have the worst problem out there. You haven't run up, the, you know, yeah. this super unique buyer objection or seller objection. No. This has been right. going on for hundred decades and decades and decades. You just need to figure out how to, how to go get around it. And that's where your language really comes in, right? Well, and I think even more than that. So, yes, all that is true. Um, even more than that, though, in – just in the little container that is objection handlers, uh, what, what I teach and what I study and what I have practiced is some systems and some, uh, some techniques and some structure on, on how, what's the process to handle an objection. So once you learn the process, then it doesn't really matter what the objection is. And the thing that really kind of empowered me, or maybe maybe I should say uh, emboldened me, was when I was uh, when I was at Remax, they said, "Hey, you're having these crazy results," and they had me do an objection handling workshop for the agents. And then they said, "Damn, that was pretty good. Would you be willing to have host that same objection handling workshop for our um, back then they called them managers, right? It's a TL. It's the people that are recruiting agents." And I said, "Well, I." I don't recruit agents and I don't know what that looks like and I don't know what objections they get, but I'll give it my best shot. And so I rolled into a conference room with like 20, you know, office, you know, basically TL recruiters sitting around a big conference table and they threw objections at me for an hour and a half and I just fielded them. And these were objections I had never received before, but I, I know the system, like I know the steps to take to, convert those and it, it really doesn't matter what the objection is once you know how to do it then it doesn't matter what they are that's that's my favorite part actually it becomes it becomes a framework that you can use over and over again <laughs> that's right it's just yeah. a framework so so for example I, you know i've been teaching this for a while and i had the structure down and like i, I knew like how to how to do the how to do the dance and i was at a you know i, I had practiced the other agent said we get more money, and but we want a lower commission, but we only want a 30-day listing. But at that price, I'll do it myself, right? All the normal stuff. So I was like, um, you know, I was Johnny on the spot for those. And I was at this listing appointment, and the people said we're at the end, and they said, yeah, whatever it was, 375 sounds like the right price, and 
great presentation. This all sounds amazing. And I'm like, okay, perfect. Uh, what else do we need to do before we get the paperwork started? And they said, well, um, you're amazing. And we really appreciate everything you've done. But we, um, we knew even before you came that uh, we're, we, we're pretty committed that we want to hire a woman. We want to hire a female agent. Well, not not a whole lot I can do about that, right? I'm not chopping it off to get this listing. So, <laughs> you know, <laughs> right? So what what do you do about that? Right? Well, so not clear, not uh, that, yeah. <laughs> not not that. Well, not in, that. In, in California, we don't we, we we don't have to have gender identity anymore. So you can you can identify yourself as That's a right. woman. Like, how how dare like you I'm insinuate that I'm not a woman right now? Yeah, I, I, <laughs> right. I'm yeah, identifying because... as a woman right now. I'm going to sign this yeah. as Mrs. Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> So the crazy part was I had never gotten that objection before. I hadn't even thought about that as an objection before. It never crossed my mind that somebody would interview me and say, you're amazing. And we knew before we, you came that we wanted to hire a woman. Now what? Well, fortunately, yeah. I know the recipe for how to do it, right? So I just pretty much followed the recipe and what came out the other end literally was a signed contract. And it took 30 <laughs> seconds or 60 seconds. <laughs> So. I'm absolutely dying inside to figure out. What, I mean, if this is too much secret sauce, right. I get it. It's, no, it's right, it's right on the other out. side of this commercial break. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Cliffhanger. Oh man. Okay. Um, so is it? Uh, is it the? I think I might have. Uh, I might have stolen this from you, Joel. It's um, in terms of like how to determine the client's core values. Is, is it the? Is it the three key questions? No, it's actually much more simple than that. Oh so really? In, okay. Uh, yeah, much much more simple. So in the realm of objection handling, um, I teach a lot of different techniques, some very advanced techniques, a whole bunch of really clever stuff. Um, but the most basic technique of all is uh, this little three-step process. And Matt, you know this. It's uh, like I call it objection handling 101. It's just the most basic structure. And that structure is step one is take their side. So no matter what they say, I take their side. I say, oh, that, I totally get it. Oh, that makes sense. Oh, that's an interesting position. Oh, like, I, I see how you'd want to hire a woman. You know, I, I might feel the same way. I can appreciate that. Whatever it is, like, just take their side. Um, why? I want to demonstrate that I'm on their side. I don't want to fight. I want to be an ally. If I get all upset and I tell them how stupid that is and what are you thinking, uh, all of a sudden I'm no longer an ally. Right now, I'm an adversary. So yeah. I want to be an ally. So yeah. instantly take their side. Oh, I totally get it. That makes sense. I I might want to hire a woman too. I get it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Step two. Step two is to give them a different perspective. That might be uh, level it up. That might be change the perspective. That might be ask them a question. That might be you know find out what's important. This was yours, Matt. Like what's important to you about finding a female agent? Right. Find out what's in there and or solve the problem. Right. Hmm. So in my step two, I said, and step two might be a couple of steps. Step two, I said, uh, great. I totally get that you want, might want to hire a woman. I might feel the same way. I'm curious what's important about hiring a female agent. And they said, well, we were looking at all these statistics and they said 72 percent of real estate agents are female. So we figured our odds are much better if we go with a bigger percentage and we hire a female because 72% of agents nationally are women. So we want the best odds to sell our house. Great. Uh -huh. So now, now I have some information. Number one, I yeah. demonstrated I'm on their side. They know I'm an ally. They know I'm not making them wrong. They know I'm not attacking them. I asked for some more information. Now I'm clear on what's happening for them. So then I just asked a couple of questions. I'm still in step two. I asked a couple of questions, and I think I said something like, um, did they give you a ratio of how many, uh, how many transactions they closed? Or were there any other stats there? And they're like, no, they just said 72% were women. And I said, well, did, they, did it also give you the statistic that the average realtor in the United States sells like 3.2 houses per year? Did you read that? And they were like, well, yeah, we did read that. I'm like, okay. So you're playing the averages, 72%, and yet 
the average agent is selling three houses a year. Um, and the average listing here is currently selling at 95 cents on the dollar. Um, is that the kind of performance that you want? Do you want an agent that sells three homes a year at 95 cents on the dollar? Is that what you'd like to have? And they were like, um, no. And I said, well, can I show you some of my last sales? And I just said, I sold this one and this one. And in the last month, I had sold a few that had sold at 98, 99, 101, 102, whatever it was back then. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, you can play the averages or you can take the money. So step three is once they go, oh, I didn't see it that way. I didn't even look at it like that. That's a good point. Like once I get some agreement back from them, then I move to step three. And step three is ask them to take a step forward. And in this case, I don't know, I think I said something like, so do you want, a, you want an average agent with, average, with an average proceeds? Or do you want to hire an agent like me that's going to get you 100% of the money and, and give you a big fat check? And they were like, well, we want the big fat check. And there's such a great okay. rhythm and phrasing to that question too that we I don't I don't know that we have time to get into that but if you just notice like because Joe this this flows effortlessly out of you but I know from taking the sure. course how much of it is a hundred percent absolutely intentional and deliberate yeah especially yeah, yeah, when yeah. you're first getting started right so that would you rather take the uh, nah, 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 it's kind of wobbly and there's a question mark at the end or would you yeah, rather yeah, take yeah. the money you know bam just hit it right yeah just it, very very good. Well, so that's really, uh, just to comment on that a little bit, that's really, you know, human beings are driven, you know, we're really run by our subconscious. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, when I, when I gave them at step three, when I gave them the option, Matt picked it, you know, Matt picked it up because he's been in the class with me. When I gave him the option, I said, so like, listen to the, the tonality and the upswing and the pitch. So would you like to go, and even those of you on video, even my expression, would you like to go with an average agent and get an average check and sell for 95 cents on the dollar? Do you want that? Like, see how, how I'm kind of uprooting all of that belief. Mm -hmm. or, yeah. or do you want to go with an agent who's going to get you 100% of the money and give you a big fat check at closing? Like, solid, like grounded. Mm -hmm. Or do you want all the money? And like, or do you want all the money? <laughs> right, like, right. With the head nodding, we want yeah. all the money. Right, want all the money. It's a, a downswing okay, in your great. voice, which, which, yeah. which puts yeah. an anchor to it. Yeah. 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 Very interesting stuff. So mm. this, this whole perspective on selling, it's very subliminal. It's very subconscious. And one of the things that I catch in agents all the time, I've listened to hundreds of listing appointments. And uh, what I hear very frequently is agents will say something like, so... Would you, would you like to, uh, what am I trying to do? They'll say, would you like to sell the house with me? Right? Versus, are yeah. you ready to sell the house with me? Do you, do right. you want to get started right now? Which is like, listen to that, that tonality. That's just, those are all the signals of question and uncertainty and I'm not sure and maybe. And, would you like to do this with me? Versus, are you ready to get started? Yeah. yeah. Right. It's a completely different message to the to the subconscious listener. Yeah, it really is. And a lot of us don't do it, don't really understand that because it's something that we just see in our daily lives or we have the lack yeah. thereof. Because if you're if you're if you're if your self-worth or confidence is lacking, you're going to yeah. go pitch swing up. But if yeah. you just know you're exactly. the shit and you just fucking rock it, <laughs> well, then, then you're just going to be like, so you're ready, ready, ready to get started or what? And people are like, oh, oh yeah. shit, okay, let's go over here. Let's, let's start this. You know, it, it's it, but yeah, there's it, definitely there's definitely a tonality to confidence. Yeah, tonality to confidence. I like that phrase a lot. Yeah, there's definitely a tonality confidence, to confidence. Definitely has tonality. Definitely has a feel and a tone and an energy. Now, which is which? Uh, here's the scary part. It's similar, but a little bit different than cocky and ego and uh, narcissism. Right, they sound very similar. Yeah, hmm. but the, but there is a distinctive difference there. Yeah, when you're confident in yourself instead of just being a pompous prick and going, "Hey, dude, yeah. check me out, I'm freaking awesome." Well, now you're just being a douche. But if you're like, "Hey, look, you guys want to get the <laughs> highest? If, if you want to get the highest check, we, we got to get started today." 
And people yeah, are just like, oh, big, well, big difference. And mm-hmm. and I think it's uh, it's sad to me that a lot of the people, a lot of the consumers, can't tell the difference. Like a lot of people right. misinterpret cockiness and ego as confidence, and they end up hiring somebody who's cocky and and running their ego around. Uh, but they're you know that's different than confidence. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's really good. Yeah, I mean, Greg, you and I have talked about it before. Like we've we've finished up an episode and gone, that just, that didn't feel right. You know, like Greg, like you and I have like gone through and gone, mm, yeah, like we went from confident into cocky there. Like we, we could feel it internally. I don't, yeah. And that's Good. the thing is, I don't know if anybody else could hear it, but I could feel it. And I'm like, yeah, let's not go there again. Cause yeah, yeah I, I, I don't want to live in that zone. It, it is unfortunate that it is very hard to tell. Sometimes I wish it was easier to tell the difference, but sometimes the cocky and the arrogant are genuinely confident, and that's why they come across that way. They just strain into overconfidence, um, yeah. you know, you, where it's not they're, it's they're it's very grounded similar. in them. Yeah, exactly. But that is well, I mean, a tonality to confidence. Well, I mean, you and I have made a decision. I mean, you and I sat down about a year ago, and we were like, okay, we don't like the way the show is going. You know, we we were we were doing certain things, and we were we were sitting high on the hog right like, this is fucking wrong this is not who we are this has got to stop immediately i mean i think one of the biggest things guys if, if you can recognize that fact in you that you are acting cocky if you have a big ego if you can put that in check and become more confident maybe you're maybe you're acting cocky because you're not 100 percent confident in your skill set so instead yeah. of you know showboating and becoming across as a douchebag to go learn some more stuff i mean go read a yeah. book Go go watch a podcast. Go go talk to a top producer. Go sharpen your skill set. Don't sure. don't make the whole industry look bad. We already look bad enough. We don't need your help. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that too. Like, um, or you know, come take my class. So, mm-hmm. you know, for me, I found that now that I, you know, I've been teaching this material for a long time, and so now I feel like um, I don't I don't do much projection. I don't. I'm not a cocky character. And yet I also feel like I can walk in anywhere and talk to anybody and it doesn't really matter what happens. They can be upset and they can be mad and they can be sad and they can be excited and they can have problems and they can have objections. And I, I'm just like, I feel like I have the tools to handle any of those. And so no, I'm do. not going in there. I'm not going in there nervous and I'm not trying to win and I'm not trying to look good and I'm not trying to be right. And, uh, you know, I'm just going in there to help people and whatever happens is okay. Well, with you, I mean, you, you walk a little quietly, but you carry a big ass freaking club. And so I think that's where people want to, like, I, you can feel it on this call. I mean, there is nothing we can throw at you that you're not going to be able to handle. And you project that confidence, not cockiness, the confidence that you, you already got it handled. You just need to, you just need to ask the question. And that just being on this call, I'll, I'll let you know that makes me as an interviewer, you know, feel comfortable with this interview because I know that no matter which direction we go with this, you got this in the back. And it's just, it's a subtle feeling that you project out. And I think that a lot of people need to start working on that or looking at that mm-hmm. or asking people some specific questions. I know when Matt took your course, he had to ask me, he had to ask a couple of people some very hard questions. And uh, I took m- like, much joy in answering those in all honesty. <laughs> just like, so like, what, like what, for example? <laughs> Oh, um, it was it was the 360 evaluation. So it was oh, yeah, uh, yeah. strengths and weaknesses. Uh, based on what I am committed to, what does not work about who I am, uh, or what does? So, uh, and another one was, what does everyone know that I cannot be counted on? Uh, <laughs> that, that, so man, that's a the, big one. <laughs> that's a good so question. Just for, the, just for the people who are listening, one of the things that I do in the course is I invite people to go through this process that is a um, like a self, a personal review, a self review where um, you go out and interview people around you in your life to say, how do I show up for you? Right? So the, the issue is lots of people, all of us, you know, there's somebody in your life that, that is a little annoying or they're a little obnoxious or you don't trust them and you don't want to give them your car keys. And, you know, there's something about that person but most of the time they don't know. And so this exercise is for us to go out and find out how other people see us. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we go out and ask some really hard questions like, 
How do I show up in the world for you? What am I good at? What do you think I stink at? Where do you think I need to grow? You know, and we, we interview other people about um, how we show up in their experience just for insight, right? The, the goal is like, um, oh, my favorite example is how often is it that somebody comes up to talk to you and they have horrible breath and they don't know? So this oh, is more, the thing, right? Oh, so it many times. All the time. So this is the thing in sales is, you know, maybe you have horrible breath. Maybe you have a big chunk of food stuck in your teeth and you don't know. And the, the key here is all of us are doing something like that, right? Maybe you interrupt a lot. Maybe you cuss a lot and it makes this one person um, uncomfortable. Maybe you... Uh, Those first two are about Greg. Oh, shut up. The first one's you. <laughs> the cussing so me, but the interrupting right? was you. You interrupt with cuss words a lot. <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> Well, so depending on the audience, that might be totally appropriate. Mm -hmm. And for Thank some God audiences, it is for our it's, audience. Yeah. It's, it's totally inappropriate for some, uh, you know, like probably not going to go over very well in church and uh, probably perfect at, you know, when you're out drinking beer and eating pizza with your buddies on a Friday night, right? That's, so the context makes a big difference too. Well, yeah, I mean, so Joel, you'll get a kick out of this. My grandfather is 94. My grandmother's 92. Somehow they got their hands on one of my episodes of my show. And uh, <laughs> my, my grandfather sits me down at the dining room table. And he's like a no bullshit guy, right? <laughs> he goes, so let's talk about your vernacular on your show. I'm like, I'm like, oh shit. <laughs> so yes, cussing around grandma and grandpa is not the best idea. But so yeah, that's right. Audience, audience sensitive, uh, audience sensitivity is, is is key when it comes to. Characters. One of the things, Joel, this is a big, this is a big shift for me, and, and I, 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 I don't probably know how much it's affected my communication style because I, I think it comes out like when, when Greg and I are, are training and, and leading, you know, masterminds and stuff like that with agents, uh, I'll, I'll find myself, you know, repeating some of these things from your course. And one of the things that really stuck out to me was that whatever their communication style is, it's not just that it's what feels comfortable for them. It's what, it's what they interpret as the right communication style. Like that's, that's right. their yeah. world. And when you communicate outside of that style, like it feels wrong to them. It's not just that they're sitting back and going, oh, this person likes to talk at a little bit different pace than I do. Like nobody does that. Right. They, they interpret that as this no. is outside of my world, which is really interesting. Yeah, they, I, I like the way you said that. They interpret it as wrong. Mm -hmm. Not good, bad, fast, slow, wrong. It's wrong. Mm -hmm. And when it's wrong for them, they don't listen. Right. And, and the thing in sales, but one of my favorite quotes, I say this all the time is in every, in every conversation, right. Assuming you have two people talking to each other in every conversation, there's going to be some disparity, right? Mm -hmm. One person's going to talk a little louder. One person's going to talk a little faster. One person, maybe Greg is going to use lots of profanity. One person <laughs> is going to be uncomfortable with profanity, right? Whatever it is, there's going to be some sort of disparity. So the key is here in the sales conversation, one of you is going to be uncomfortable. And in the sales realm, I just invite you to be the one to get out of your comfort zone to be in their world and speak their language, right? So if I'm hanging out with Greg, in fact, I just invited Greg the next time you're up in Sacramento, come, we'll go check out this taco joint. So if I'm hanging out with Greg and we're having tacos at my favorite taco joint, Right, I'm probably going to cuss a lot, right? Because that's Greg's world. So we're going to hang out and eat tacos and drop f bombs, whatever. <laughs> so, so uh, <laughs> the thing is, I want to I want to speak the client's language in the client's conversation because who am I working for? The client, right? The customer's right. And if they want to if they want to drop f bombs and whatever, oh, okay, good, right? And the more that I'm able to get into their realm, the more that I'm able to speak their language the more effective the communication happens. Because right, I feel comfortable with you, right? Because I, cause now we're on the same wavelength. I'm like, oh, he's like me. Okay, cool. I, I, there's a level of trust that then starts to build and a relationship starts to form. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I think that's... I think that's one of the things that I like the most about doing like outbound prospecting calls and stuff like that is the ability to practice that on a consistent basis to the mirror and match. You know, if they're gruff, yeah. I'm gruff. If they're soft, I'm soft. Um, yeah, that's huge, huge. And it's that's just, it's just, 
Yeah, it really is because like you're saying, it's the way they feel that they they would like to communicate to the world. My job to understand it, interpret it, and then react to it accordingly so that I can make them, like you said, since I'm working for them potentially, or quotes, I need to make them, I need to get into their world. They don't need to get into mine. And yeah. a lot of the times people, are, and correct me if I'm wrong, Joel, but a lot of the times people feel that they need, they need to get the client into their world as the agent, ver, vice versa. Yeah, yeah exactly. That's, uh, agents do that all the time. And I think it's a failure from the salesperson. Uh, one of the triggers I get is when people say, well, let me tell you how I work. Here's how I sell houses. Here's how my business runs. Let me tell you about my team. This is how I do it. I'm just thinking, oh, God, they're <laughs> done. You just lost them. Right? So it's not about you, right? Again, for who are you working? Right? If right. you're working for the mm-hmm. client, if you're working well, for that- the client, and, and uh, let's say, for example, the client is Greg. And Greg, I'm just, just because this is fun, I'm not picking on you, I swear. But if it's the okay. client is Greg, and Greg is dropping F-bombs left and right, and I start saying, well, dang gum it. <laughs> You're out. Well, Next. <laughs> yeah. right? He's just going to go, who the hell are you? Get out, right? If that's going to yeah. make him uncomfortable. Like, let, let that sink in, right? If I'm saying, dang gum it, oh, shucks. I'm going to make Greg uncomfortable because... Greg cusses freely and comfortably and fluidly. So my, uh, my aversion to that is going to make mm-hmm. him feel wrong, and he's not going to be comfortable in my world. Yep. And so he's going to find another agent. There was, a, there was someone that was making comments on one of my posts the other day, and they were saying stuff like that. Oh, golly gee, or gosh, or gee willikers. I'm sitting there going, what is going on with you, human? Like, what? <laughs> Say something it's that makes wrong sense to you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it doesn't yeah, make it feels sense. wrong to you. I didn't really know did. Facebook worked in 1956. Where'd you come from? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's so true. Yeah. I, was, I got a time traveler on my on my pod. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. Uh, but so, I, I think that if you guys are trying to get more sales, learn what Joel is putting out there right now. Understand your language differences. Um, and how you can how you start practicing. I mean, go go talk to your spouse, your kids, go talk to your best friend, go talk to your neighbor, hear the way that they speak and just practice on them. I mean, Joel, did, yeah. when did you pick this up? I mean, did you have like a aha, bing, light bulb moment or was there something in a, a book or I mean, how did, how did you come to this, you know, understanding? Um, I think, I think early on I took some some training, right? So I, I came out of being uh, an engineer and got into real estate and I did a couple of flips and I got into agenting. <clears throat> and I was good as an agent when I was working with people that I already knew. So people that I knew, I knew them and they knew me and we were connected and they trusted me. And, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I think a relatively decent human being and relatively intelligent and people trusted me. It was easy. As soon as I got through that group and I had to reach out to new people, like my results died. And so mm. I thought like, oh man, I need to get some help. <laughs> so I just, you know, like any good engineer, I started studying and I mm. signed up for classes and I took workshops and, and uh, I, I learned a little bit here and there and I learned this piece from here and that piece from there. And here it is a bunch of years later. And now I'm a, a NLP master practitioner, instructor, trainer. I'm a licensed hypnotist. I'm a, <laughs> you know, I'm like a few units shy of a degree in psychology um, I've, I've played with speech coaches and, and, uh, you know, like I'm just fascinated by this model and, you know, I'm just my, my training as an engineer, I'm, I'm just really committed to solve breakdowns. So when anybody's in breakdown, I think, um, and I, I spent a long time working on my, my own personal biases. So whenever I hear an argument, I can easily walk, I don't know how, how I know this, but I can walk in and I can hear the place where this person is right and has a valid position and this person is right and has a valid position and I can just feel where they're miscommunicating. And sometimes I can walk in there and say, well, what he's trying to say is blah, blah, blah. And what she's trying to say is blah, blah. You guys are kind of saying the same thing and you're speaking different languages and you're missing each other. So I don't know. I just see it that hmm, way. Interesting. And, and for me, it's all about, the way in which the communication is happening. I think that most people want, we're all pretty much moving in the same direction, right? And and in this realm of real estate, 
Um, they want to sell and you want to help them, or they want to buy and you want to help them, or they want to buy that house and you want to represent them, whatever it is. We're all moving in the same direction. And we, we get derailed, right? What happens for the salesperson is instead of saying, you know, let me help you get in that direction. Okay, here's the deal with that house. It's this price, it's that long, it's been in the market this many days. You know, what do we do to make sure we get it? What the salesperson does is, well, let me tell you how many homes I've sold, and here's what I think you should do. And me, 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 me. And all of a sudden, the client's, you know, starting to back up because you're not talking about the client, you're talking about yourself, and they start to protect themselves. That comes up in objections mm -hmm. and whatever else. Yeah, manifest so, like in, in other ways. I'm curious, Joel, yeah. like on, when you do have, like let's say you get to the point you, you're starting to – you're starting to succeed in the sense that you you've got a good track record of deals under your belt. Let's say you have a team and, you, and you're really getting your system dialed in. So you have a pretty good idea of who your ideal client is. You have a good system for how to get your ideal client the ideal results that they typically want. So you have a good sense of like, hey, this is like this is the Matt Johnson system for selling homes. And you you start to yeah. you start to shift over from working with anybody that will work with you towards just looking for the people that kind of fit your system. How do you, like, mm -hmm. rather than That's saying, tough. hey, Mr. Prospect, here's how we work, here's how I work, like, how would you phrase that to still kind of convey some of that same information and convey the sense that you're you're trying to see if there's a good fit? Because you do have a definite system that you want to make sure that th that's going to work for them. So t what do you mean by you have a definite system? If well, let's say you have a system for house how house. somebody, yeah, let's say you're a listing agent, right? And you've got it systematized out to where you have, like, you, you don't work with buyers. You're not going to be there at every showing, right? So you're not a typical, you're, you're not a part-time agent. You're not someone that can be at their beck and call. You have a team. Let's say you're like Greg and you have a team manager who actually does a pretty hefty share of the communication uh, with an active seller. And that may not be what they're looking for. Uh, so like Greg has that part of his presentation where he kind of does tell them how his team works. So I'm curious on how you would phrase that or how you would come into that discussion so that you don't okay. put them, uh, like backpedaling with it, like making it sound like it's all about me, me, me. Um, well, I'm, I'm, I have a little bit of a caution flag when I hear, Hey, I have a system and this is how I do it. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I think, so why is that? What's, method. what's the caution flag? <laughs> well, I, I have a system. I, I have a system is all about me, and here's how I do it. It's all about me. And I think there's two there's two sides of that. The first side is uh, getting the contract signed. Getting the contract signed, 100% client centric. So once I get the client in rapport and I find out what they want and where they're headed, and we get into agreement, and they say that sounds amazing. And, you know, when can we start? And we get a signature. Great. Now we have a working signed fiduciary uh, relationship. So then I might say, uh, now I think this is the part where you're talking about your system. Like, here's the steps that we take that gets the home sold. Yeah, is that mm -hmm. what you're talking so, about? So you would you would do your best to to wait on that in terms of how it actually works in a client relationship until after the contract is signed or there's an agreement reached that you're going to work together, then it's an issue. Okay. Here's how we're going to work together. Um, I, I don't, I don't find it all that necessary to tell people here's what I'm going to do and when I'm going to do it. And here's how it happens. And this is what that looks like. And it's every other Thursday. And um, I very rarely find the need to do that before getting a contract signed. Really? Why is That's that? Interesting. Yeah. I'm curious. Uh, I don't know. I mean, if you because you're that stinking good. I was going to say, why. is it would you attribute it to the trust and and the rapport? Yeah, I mean, I I think, well, you know, if you if you go in, I, I really like this example because I think it lands for people. If you mm -hmm. if you roll into the dentist and you have a tooth problem, you need a root canal. The dentist is going to say, um, uh, yeah, come on, it really hurts. Great, come on in. Um, do we have your uh, Matt, do we have your stuff on file? Have you been in my office before? And you go, yeah, I've been here. Great. Um, any changes in your address? The, the reception is going to say this. Any changes, your address, phone number, blah, 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 blah. No, all that's the same. Okay, great. We have your insurance on file? Yep. Okay, come on in. Before I touch you, we want to get an x-ray to make sure we know what we're talking about. Um, do you have any metal in your body, pacemaker, anything before I put you in the x-ray machine? Nope. Okay, good. Get in there. Boom. I got an x-ray. Um, okay, so here's um, here's what we found. 
uh, this is what's going on. And sadly, look at this x-ray. Look at this, man. You, uh, you need a root canal. Um, do you have a ride home in case I need to knock you out? Do you have a ride if we need to anesthetize you? Yeah, I got a ride. Okay, so here's what that looks like. You, uh, you need a root canal, and they cost this much, and you can pay it like this, or you can have your insurance do it, and I can schedule it on one of these days. What, what would you like to do? You go, well, I guess I need to get it done. What's your first available? Uh, okay, let's do it on this date. All right, that's tomorrow afternoon. Great, so you just agreed to get a root canal, and what you did not get was, okay, so here's how I do root canals. I'm going to mm -hmm. bring you into the office. You're not mm -hmm. going to eat for six hours before so your stomach's empty. I'm going to get you all doped up so you don't feel the pain. I'm going to put yeah. you in a twilight sedation. I'm going to rip out that old tooth. I'm going to put in all this stuff to isolate it. I'm going to pull the tooth. I'm going to drill out the thing. I'm going to blow it with air. I'm going to put cement in there, blah, blah, blah. blah. Like, all those steps are secondary. Mm -hmm. So do I need you're, to You're selling them just on the end result. You're, so you're, so you're diagnosing... Sell, and then, then selling them on the agreement of we're, we're going to agree to fix this problem together and then – Correct. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, it's, okay. my belief, it's my belief that the only time that somebody says, well, what are you going to do? How are you going to sell it? Hmm. How many open houses are you going to do? How many ads are you going to run? How often are you going to be here? What is it going to look like? Tell me what your signs look like. In my um, – not so humble, completely biased opinion in my belief, <laughs> um, in my belief that those are all signs of mistrust. Interesting. Right. 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 So, uh, so a question, uh, question for you, for either of you, Let, let's say Greg, question for you, Greg, how, uh, how many homes have you sold in the last 12 months, roughly your team? Now we're in somewhere in the 50 range. Okay. So uh, when was the last time somebody said to you, uh, hey, Greg, uh, how long have you been licensed? Uh, honestly? Have you, have you heard that recently? I, have, I don't think I've even heard that when I got into the, into the business. That also was 18 years so, ago. So. so some people get that. How long mm -hmm. have you been licensed? Have you sold any homes in my area? Have you sold any homes in this price range? Mm -hmm. How often do you get that objection? Never. No. no. Why not? Because uh, they're comfortable. Mm -hmm. You built the rapport. You built their reputation. You, yeah. You're in rapport. You you feel confident. They trust you. You've done a good job. So who is getting that? Who is getting that objection? People that sound insecure. People that are like, oh my god, this is a million dollar. I've never seen a house like this. Right? But homeowners are going to go. Have you been licensed more than a week? What happened? So, <laughs> It's, it's my belief that those kind of objections, people that say, I need to hear this, I need to see your sign, I want to see your mock-up on the flyers, are you going to do flyers in full color, are you going to do 12-pound paper, all of that is fear from a client who didn't get a good, secure feeling of trust. Yeah. You know, what? one of the things that you're, you're, that you're hitting on right now, Joel, is something that's very near and dear to my heart. People always ask me, so Greg, how do you close someone to get them to sign your listing agreement? And I said, well, first off, you're doing it wrong. You have to open with tremendous amounts of value so that they, at the end of it, they're not, you're not asking them, so should we get the papers and contract signed? They're asking you, so what's the next steps? How do we move forward? Exactly. No, where do we go from Huge here? Huge difference. Huge difference. Huge difference. And I think a lot of people don't understand that. They think, well, it still gets the, the, the contract signed. Yeah, it does. But you're going to have to do a lot of browbeating and a lot of negotiating, a lot of massaging to do it you know, the way that traditionally is done. What Joel was talking about and what I was just describing at the end there is you're opening the door so wide with value that at the end of that first meeting or second meeting, however you run your listing appointments, it makes no logical first sense one meeting, not to not work with you. Yeah. And I and, I, and a lot of people are like, well, I don't have any value. Go write down all the things that you can bring to the table. I guarantee you, you can bring a ton of value. Because a lot of the times, people just don't understand what we do. And they think that we just drive around in our Mercedes with our $3,000 suits on, you know, <laughs> and put a sign on the yard. And then, bada bang, bada boom, bada boom, bada bing, you get like ten, twenty, yeah. thirty thousand dollars $30,000. When in reality, <laughs> it's a rat race from hell and a dumpster fire of a deal most of the time. And you're stressed <laughs> out <laughs> and up forever. <laughs> but... Yeah, I mean, if you show them how it really works, they understand how it goes, and they they're, yeah. they're, they'll see the value of what you bring. Hmm. Yeah. Totally yeah. One agree. thing I'd love to do totally. with you, Joel, is go go is level up a little bit in terms of um, who we're speaking to. 
and some of the challenges okay. that uh, that agents start to encounter as they move up where where they're not so much working directly with clients, but now they're prospecting for relationships, either they're recruiting or they're starting to build relationships with, let's say, lender partners or other vendors and um, uh, and just build, building out more of a, like building it, you know, becoming more of an entrepreneur. And sometimes there's a lot more on the line than just one deal. This could be a stream of 50 deals a year or something. They're building relationships with banks and, and other types of vendors and things like that. So um, I want to I give out, uh, there was one example that I came across in your, your level shifting examples where <clears throat> the objection is uh, from like almost from one of your agents, or you could even deal with it if it was an objection internally within yourself. But um, the objection was, I don't need to do any lead generation today because I have a buyer. Just such a great. <laughs> <idea. laughs> I, I love that. So, uh, so share with me what you, Joel, team leader or b boss of that agent who comes to you and says, you know, like, hey, I'm too busy to do lead gen today because I've got a client. Like, how do you deal with that objection? Um. So my favorite way to solve objections is to help people self-discover their own answer. Okay. So I, I could make this agent wrong. I could prove to them that their thinking is silly, or I can help them grow and evolve and find their own level. Right. And so me personally, um, I would just start asking some questions and I would say, um, okay, so you've been lead generating pretty regularly for three or four days or whatever, two or three weeks, right, new agent, and, and you have a buyer, right? So how many days did you have in to get that buyer? And they'll say, uh, you know, 10 days, great. How many calls did you make in those 10 days? I made 100. Okay, so you made 100 calls to get a buyer. Great. Um, okay, and how many buyers would you like to have this month? Well, I'd like to have four. Okay, so that means we need to find three more. So if it takes you 10 days to get one, and you want to get three more in the next 20 days, uh, how many, you know, how many calls do you need to make per day to make that happen? Um, wow, well, I guess I need to make twice as many per day to get that many in five days instead of 10 days. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So if you need to make twice as many per day, then what happens if you skip a day? <laughs> um, oh, I guess that puts me behind. Okay, well, if you're behind and you're still committed to getting this many per month, how do you solve that problem? Are you going to work nights? Are you going to come in Saturday? Or are you going to lower your goal? Like, what, what, how are you going to fix that? Right? So I want them to, like, opt in to the solution that's right for them. I don't want to make them wrong and put them in a headlock and beat them up. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't want that role, and I don't want that relationship. I want them to be empowered that they made their own choice. That's really, it's yeah. a really, yeah. it's a really, it's a really good, good thing. I mean, Hank Avix, uh, by the way, gives you massive kudos. He thinks you're a badass quote. Yeah. Um, Hank, Hank's an awesome it, guy. I like Hank a whole bunch. He is yeah, an awesome dude. Guy. And I just, I just got back with a two and a half day class last week with him and about 11 other people. And he talks about stop, you know, prescribing and start diagnosing. Mm -hmm. You know, so a lot of us prescribe yeah. what to do because we get so used to like someone's, Hey, I got a problem. Great. Bam. This is what you do to fix it. That's yeah. prescribing. Here's what I think you should do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And, but but what you just did, you diagnosed. You asked and yeah. asked and asked and asked and allowed them to come with a self-realization like, oh, shit, if I don't do this, then I'm behind my own schedule. Boom. Now what are you going to do yeah. to fix that? And, yeah, um, I want them to buy in. If I have them buy into their solution, then it's their solution. Yeah. And if I say, wait a minute, wait a minute, you got to do this many a day every day. This is right now. It's now their they're beholden to my opinion and I, I don't want to beat them up. I don't want to hold them. I don't want to be, I don't want that role because maybe they have a higher goal than I have for them. I don't know. Right. I don't know what the right thing is for them. Maybe they're going to say, you know what? My kid's homesick and my kid's got cancer and this is what I'm up to right now. My whatever changed. And this is, I, I, I don't, I, I don't think that I know what's right for other people. So I just start asking questions. I'm like, okay, well, what do you want to do? And what does that look like? And then what happens if you do this? And what do these numbers look like? And then what happens? And how are we going to solve that? And um, I, I'm, I think my, one of my strong suits is I'm eternally curious. And so I just, so I just ask lots of questions. Yeah, I just right ask to... tons and tons of questions. My father is always, you know, the grandmaster has always made a, a comment to me, Greg, always stay in a state of curiosity. 
consistently yeah. curious, you know, because yeah. that way you, you can never be wrong if you're always asking questions. And besides, you know, the person who, control, who controls the conversation is he or she who asks the questions. You can steer conversations. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's, so the, it, but so it's the whole quote really, the, the whole quote really is he or she who speaks the most dominates the conversation. And he or she who asks all the questions controls the conversation. I want the client to dominate it, and I want to control it. Mm -hmm. There's a big distinguishing difference there. So he or she who talks the most dominates. He or she who asks the questions controls. Brilliant. Yeah. yeah, that's really good. Yeah, I want the client to do all the talking, and I want to control it. How do I control it? I control it by asking all the questions. And the, the questions control the direction of the answer. The yeah, and, and there was the there was a key moment, Joel, in, in that kind of that scenario that, that we laid out where you were handling that. There was there's a really key moment where you kind of it gets to the key question, which can get really it, it can get really confrontational and, if, and you can lose it right there. Right. So you, you do. do a really great job of leading them up. And then all of a sudden you have to kind of drop the hammer, which is which is where you have to ask them the question that directly confronts the fact that their actions are not lining up with those goals. And, yeah. and there was a great way that you put it, which was you, you threw out a couple of solutions and basically asked them, how would you like, you know, how are you going to solve the problem? I think is the phrase they use. How are you going to solve that problem? You know, are you going to do this? Are you going to do that? Or are you going to do this? And you could throw yeah. out some ideas, but that's like, you, it's very easy, I think, to like ask those questions and then right at that moment kind of lose it and go, you know, like, look, like, it's just, it's not going to work. Like, here's what's going to happen. You make a definitive statement instead of asking a question. Yeah. And you can, like, all that work that you build to build up to that point is, is lost by getting you prescriptive too early. You lose it. You know, and yeah. I feel like that's very easy to do. So it's there. I thought that was just the phrasing of that was really good. Like, hey, I set up a scenario. Now, now it's time to drive the point home. You still drove it home with a question and asked them, how would you like to solve it? Because you can always lower yeah. your goal. That's right, right? Maybe, maybe. And sometimes right that is the solution. Them, maybe the right answer for them is, hey, with what's going on in my life right now, I'm totally okay uh, lowering my goal. And this is, you know, this is the new, this is my new benchmark for this month because blah, blah, blah. Okay, mm -hmm. right now I'm clear that you're not slacking off. You adjusted the, you adjusted the finish line. Okay, great. How can I support you in this new goal? Yeah. That's okay. That's mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, we were just talking about that on our mastermind this morning with our guys. And, uh, they were talking about, you know, well, I want to do this many calls, but, you know, life gets in the way. And we're just talking about the fact that you need you have to account for that in the goal, right? Your goals cannot be, well, if everything goes perfectly this week, I'll do X many. Well, life is never <laughs> going to go perfectly. So let's count on it not going perfectly. Let's count on it going not to not to shit, not to hell in a handbasket necessarily, but yeah. let's account for, let's say, 20 percent of life not going the way we want to. And let's set our goals based on that not based on well if everything go if if the if the, the ball rolls perfectly my way into the pocket then I'll do 1500 calls this week but <laughs> you know, most of the time I hit 12 you know what I'm saying um so yeah I think that it's a different it's a different mindset to have but yeah and and, and Greg you've talked about the pullback method this is a great example when you're helping someone or even when you're coaching yourself because you can coach yourself through this stuff too you can say look well or do I need to like reset my goals and that can act as like a pullback method where you go, no, I'm not going to reset my goals. I'm going to figure mm -mm. out how to get around it. I'm going to figure out how to get over this obstacle. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Joel and I were talking about that off air about that. We actually were riffing on the pullback method, you know, yeah. when it comes to scripting. Yeah. And Joel's like, yeah, that's called yeah, the pullback funny. method. I'm like, I know. That, that, that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah. I mean, I think that's one of the, that is an important thing. I mean, constantly mm -hmm. be reevaluating your goals. And one of the things that I've helped me really change my mindset is I don't have goals anymore. I have projects because nice. I, I want to work the project, find the work, the problem, find the solution. Don't, and it doesn't have anything attached to me emotionally, you know, inside. If I don't meet my goal, it just means I need to, I just need to work the project and find and work the problem and find yeah. the solution. Um, and it's okay to, to, to have those things be moving and moving and shifting. I mean, I'm a very hard headed human being when it comes to goals. Um, and I, I feel that if I, if I set a goal here and then I don't achieve that goal, it hits me on a personal level. And I, that really, that bothers me a lot. And I'm learning, I'm learning how to readjust my goals 
so that I can start hitting them, so I can start seeing those successes, so that I can start getting that positive reinforcement in my subconscious brain, so that I can up my game, up my goal or project level to a higher, higher bar as I grow as an agent, as a human, as everything else. Um, yeah. I mean, one of these days, I want to be like Joel when I grow up. You know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope you never grow up, dude. So. <laughs> Me neither. <laughs> well, sadly, that may not be too far off, either one of us. All right. Um, so, Joel, remind syndrome. us, uh, r remind people of where they should go to check out the course. Yeah, so the course is called The Language of Agreement, and you can just go to thelanguageofagreement.com. And um, I think the very best thing any salesperson can do to accelerate their business is, again, my uh, completely biased, not so humble opinion is sign up for this course. It's NLP and hypnosis and blah, 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 all focused on getting salespeople to help solve uh, problems. And the other thing is uh, record yourself, yeah. right? We all think that we're, we all think that we're Jedis. Uh, record yourself, listen to what you're saying to people and then listen to it when you're not sitting in the hot seat. And uh, it's, it's humbling. It's humbling. So those are my two recommendations. If you want to be a Jedi, right, sports stars, movie stars, everybody watches and listens to themselves on video. Do that if you want to be a Jedi. Do that. And then, you know, come train with me if you want to take, you know, if you feel like you need to up your game, come train with me and we'll turn you into a Jedi too. Uh, for anyone who's watching this live, this video, uh, I have put the link for Joel's website and uh, his course twice in the news feed, once in the beginning, oh, once just now. So you guys go ahead and find those links. Go ahead and go and click on those and get your Jedi Knight certification <laughs> in real estate. <laughs> one uh, one last thing real quick. We were talking earlier about the difference between, you know, helping people and solving this issue versus, you know, trying to convince them. I'm 100. I'm 100 convinced that when we operate on this realm of let me tell you how great I am and and you should work with me because I sold that house and I'm amazing and but wait don't answer yet it slices it dices it comes with free shipping and buy it today when we <laughs> when we saw when we when we uh, pitch from this kind of a place this is why salespeople say it's a numbers game. You got to do one out of 50. You got to you got to call 100 people. You got to call keep calling. It's a numbers game. It's a numbers game because the the approach is so bad. And yet when you come from a good place of oh, look, I'm really committed to helping people and I'm going to solve those problems and I'm going to make it all about the customer and I'm going to come from contribution and help them solve their issue. It's the numbers game goes away instead of one out of 100, you know, like my goal is like two out of three. Three out of five. Like I, I, I'm. It's a different realm when you come from this, you know, come from contribution and help people and solve their issues. When people are clear that you're on their side and they're looking for somebody to represent them, mm -hmm. they say yes. When you're trying to sell them because you want the commission, they're clear that you're representing themselves, and you get one out of fifty or one out of a hundred. That, that, that's yeah. the difference. That's interesting. People want someone who's going to represent them, not you. Themselves, not you. Themselves. And the, and way, have... the way most of us sell, is it's clear that we're trying to get a listing. We're trying to convince them to list with me. Let me tell you how I do it. Let me tell you how my team runs, right? I'm representing my own business, which is not about the customer. And so they're clear that you're in it for yourself, that you're not looking out for them. They want somebody to represent them. Yeah. That's why they really do. Game for most. You know, I, I was uh, yeah, we, sitting at a listing appointment the other day, and uh, I was asking. He was, he was, he. Was, we were going through the same, the same series of questions, and it just dawned on me. I'm like, you know what? I'm gonna try not to get this listing. I mean, I'm not gonna offend them or do anything horrible, run through the house streaking or something like that. But I mean, <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, yeah, I'm not like, eh, maybe that's kind of like, <laughs> maybe know. a little bit. I mean, the, the night is young. The, that's all I'm saying. The night is young. The, the night is young, sir. <laughs> um, but I mean, what I decided to do is I decided to go, I started to ask about them, what they were looking for, what their last experiences were. And it really, I, I, I dug into that onion, started peeling, peeling back the layers. I opened up amazing things that I would have no way of understanding. And I was able to shed light on a few things. And the dude is like, oh my God, man, you're like, you're hitting like almost all the points here, what we want. I'm like, how did I do that? It's because I stayed consistently curious instead of dictating, well, this is me and that's my team and this is how we do it. And look at me and <gasps> I'm pretty damn cool. Well, the the cool thing is you didn't give them anything. You just said, what do you want? And they said, blah, 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 blah. Here's what we want. And what do you want yeah. that to look like? 
blah, 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 blah. Here's what it looks like. And in a perfect world, when would that happen? Blah, 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 blah. This is what we want. And so when they say, oh, God, that was everything that we wanted. I know because you just said what you wanted. I asked and they said what they wanted. So now the conversation <laughs> is all of their goals and dreams are on the table because I let them talk. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I asked, and one of my favorite questions, I asked the guy, I'm like, what's more important to you, Dan? Is it, you know, more money or is it getting the home sold in a shorter amount of time? So, oh man, I just want to get this thing sold. I'm like, okay, wh- what would be the perfect time frame for you coming on the market within 15 days or less? I'm like, is that five zero or one five? It's like one five. I'm like, great. We'll get our team up here and we'll do an interview. You can meet the rest of everybody and we can get this party started. It's like, great. great. How, what's the, as soon as you can do it. I'm like, wow, that was so simple. <laughs> yeah it's so yep. simple <laughs> matt can we oh, have yeah. him back let, let them drive <laughs> yes if joel if joel can stand to hang out with us for another hour sure, we'll absolutely sure. get him back but yeah yeah you <laughs> so guys that was a lot of fun. you guys are great we had uh it was fun and enlightening and insightful and, and lots of good laughs that was awesome you guys <laughs> all right guys so yes. uh so for us <laughs> um uh so be sure to check out the language of agreement.com so that is joel's course i've taken it it's phenomenal i went through the exercises like greg mentioned that we did like the 360 review so all, all that stuff is phenomenally informative and insightful just about yourself we should, should go yeah. do that uh, to connect with us, make sure to follow us on Facebook. Do not friend. Make sure to follow. Uh, and then uh, the best place to connect with us as far as the show is just to get into uh, our email list. So you get the latest episodes delivered to you every Tuesday. Uh, just go to the rockstarsocialmediakit.com. That is our Facebook Live free training. So if you want to be able to do Facebook Live like Greg does where he's talking about the latest listings and market updates and fun things to do and all that stuff, um, that is that training course, that free video training is where we actually go deep into how exactly you can do that. Uh, so that's right. at rockstarsocialmediakit.com. And then Greg, they can uh, book a call with you as well if they are potentially serious about getting into one-on-one coaching. How do they do that? Kim, you guys go to bookmcdaniel.com. Bookmcdaniel.com is very, very simple. If you guys are um, you're thinking about doing one-on-one and you have the money and you guys want to put it towards something, give me a call. Go book a 30-minute session with me. Uh, we'll do an exploratory call. Okay. See if I'm the right fit for you and you're the right fit for me because if it's not a hell yes, it's going to be a hell no. And I don't want to take your money if it's not going to, if it's not going to be a hell yes. So I know that's it. So that I'm going to be coaching on prospecting, lead gen, scripts, tonality, a lot of stuff with Joel's talking about. I'm going to try to be like Joel one of these days, but I'm not quite there yet, <laughs> uh, but I'm, but I'm coming after you, buddy. Um, and then you can go to book Johnson, not book a big Johnson, just book Johnson uh, <laughs> for, uh, for Matt, what, what are they going to book you for? Yeah. So, so if you need specific help getting systems installed in your business, if you're ready to scale, if you're ready to either start or you're in the process of building a team uh, and you need help with those specific types of systems, uh, that's where I can, uh, can really help you. So, um, and awesome. of course, if obviously if you're interested in uh, producing a podcast, if that's like the next step for you, uh, if you are getting into coaching, speaking, consulting, um, that, that is definitely something that we really, really enjoy. Those are the types of people that I love helping and representing and helping you forward your brand uh, and basically designing a category that you can dominate. So uh, those are the two types of reasons to reach out to me. So that is bookjohnson.com. Uh, and of course, make sure to share, subscribe, and uh, tell people about the show. We love that you guys do that. Guys, We, uh, as you have noticed, we have not put a bunch of ad dollars behind the show. Uh, the show is doing very well and continues to grow because you guys share it. We really love you guys for that. So we appreciate mm-hmm. everything that you guys do to help us grow. Yeah, we really do, guys. Matt and I started the show two and a half, almost three years ago now. Can't believe how time flies, dude. Mm-hmm. Um, and we got into this business, in, uh, this podcasting business, with the sole, you know, <laughs> mindset of bringing value to agents who can't afford the premium coaching. So we wanted to make sure that you guys can grow and thrive in this, and thrive in this industry, um, and, yeah. and and not have to, you know, go go hungry and eat ramen. And your kids are not going to have new clean diapers. We want to make sure all those necessities are taken care of uh, before you guys, so you guys can live your life and get out of living in this fucking, you know, cubicles and having TPS reports and three bosses to report for and, you know, time clocks you have to punch. I mean, Ouch. that sucks. That stuff that's, sucks. That's a nice, all, all three of us, me. our skin just crawled. Yeah. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> <laughs> Terrible. All right, guys. Let's, uh, right. let's put a nice little bow on this one, McDaniel. Yes, 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 we will, Johnson. All right, guys. Until next time, peace out, ninjas. We go.